Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. The entire perimeter of this rural Nevada property is surrounded by 10-foot chain fences topped with barbed wire, making it seem more like a prison compound than a family home. But Scott and Susanna, the couple who live there, aren't worried about possible burglars. They're more concerned about protecting the public from their unusual and potentially deadly pets. Their 10-acre property is home to a variety of exotic creatures, including tigers, lions, wolves, and other predators that many would consider too dangerous to keep at home. You don't eliminate the danger. What you do is you mitigate the risk. When it comes to safely keeping predators as pets, the more familiar the animal is with their handlers, the safer the interaction is. <laughs> oh, look at that way. <laughs> Susanna is clearly very comfortable with her feline companion. And although the lioness is obviously unsettled by the presence of our camera crew, she shows no sign of threatening behavior towards her keeper. Yeah, that's my girl. That's my girl. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. She can knock me down. When Scott first met his partner, Susanna, she already owned some unusual pets, including reptiles and big cats. How did I get this? Uh, I met Susanna. I was actually a defense contractor working at the Air Force Base. And when I met her, she was downsizing. She had two tigers and five dogs. And one or two, they could have been considered wolf dogs. Even though she is trained in business and economics, Susanna spent most of her life being hands-on with animals, starting as a child riding horses in Eastern Europe. She has been keeping reptiles and dogs since the early 1980s and big cats since the mid-90s. Shortly after I met her, I found out she had tigers, and it was a case of, you, you know, I'd like to go see my tigers. I was like, oh, okay, we'll go to the zoo, and, you know, she has some that she treats as her own, and, what does she do? She hands me a milk bottle and go here and give her a bottle of milk, and I was milk feeding her. At first, 
Scott was understandably apprehensive about meeting Susanna's bigger cats, but he quickly became familiar with the unique requirements of owning exotic pets. To me, they're like extra large dogs, but that do weigh 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 600 pounds. And you gotta take that into account. Uh, when we get animals, we start right away when we get them, no matter if they're you know, three weeks old or six months old, training them on a leash, teaching them that no, they don't jump on us, no, we're not a play toy. We're here for love and affection and you know, to move you around, but you know, we're not gonna roughhouse with you and play. You know, we'll give you all the toys you need, give you the playmates or give you the entertainment you need, but not with us. Those playmates generally come from the local dog rescue and act as companions and teachers to the exotic animals. Actually, some of the dogs we got are wilder than the tigers because they're actually born in the wild. And a rescue group picks them up and you know, we have rehomed some of them. And they've ended up with either tiger or liger. And part of the reason we do it is, well, first we do it at young, but it gives them a companion, gives them a playmate, and they learn from the dog how to play because the dog won't allow the rough tiger play. So it tones the tiger down a little bit. My worst animal bite was from two dogs fighting and I was breaking it up and I got in, in between and I got bit instead. They have disagreements usually at, at feeding time, who gets the biggest piece. It, you'll see that, you know, dogs do that together anyway. And they're very respectful of each other and the dog is usually the boss. And it's not just the dogs that come from rescue situations. Some of the animals here have been surrendered by private owners who learned the hard way that keeping an exotic pet is not at all like keeping a domestic dog or cat. It's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. I know it's not for everybody. It's something you gotta put a lot of thought in if you go into it. But if you want it, you gotta be prepared to deal with a lot of issues. Uh, it's not just, I have this animal and it looks great. No, you, you have this animal and you gotta take care of it because they're completely dependent on you. Scott and Susanna are well aware that taking care of their animals' welfare is a full-time job. You know, you don't do something like this just because it's a cool thing to do. It's not like I can take two weeks off and go to the beach somewhere. No, I gotta worry about them being fed, being watered, being clean, veterinary care for any reason. I'm always sore. <laughs> uh, there's always something to do. Every day's different. It depends on the time of year in the winter because the property is so vast and we have to have water to all the animals. Is you know, If we have freezing temperatures, check to see if water hoses are broken, if water manifolds are broken. Make sure that animals haven't destroyed something. It's never dull, I can tell you that. We've taken in a lot of animals and we just take them in like you take an animal from the shelter. It just needed a new home and we treat them like a pet. In fact, Scott and Susanna even take the unusual step of making sure their pets get enough exercise by walking their big cats on leash. It's a practice that most pet owners are very familiar with. But when the animal you're leading weighs between 300 and 600 pounds and is capable of killing you within seconds, it's a risky activity. And when your predator pet is weary of a camera crew, it's a practice that could be life-threatening. And he's the one that came from Las Vegas Zoo. Yeah. He's an attention hog. He wants to be on camera everywhere. And he's the only one we don't don't leash leash walk because you they were hands off with him so he doesn't know what a correction is. Um, and he's just perfectly happy and he's really easy to move because he'll just follow me anywhere. So uh, you know, put a transport cage up to his enclosure and he'll walk right in for me. Yeah, you really hate it here, huh, buddy? The relationship between human and pet takes on life-changing importance when the animals you're dealing with are highly effective predators.
with claws sharp enough to sever blood vessels, teeth that can rip through flesh and sinew, and jaws strong enough to crush bones. Certain people don't want us to have these animals. It's so special that, you know, or so dangerous, I, I shouldn't have it. Well, are you gonna take away my chainsaw too? Because it's so dangerous, I shouldn't have it. I understand some of the stuff on the animal welfare issue, but that should be for any animal. You know, don't have one standard for exotic animals and a different for your dog or house cat. It should run across the gamut. Making one animal more special than the other, it, to me, is wrong. You know, they all should be treated well. American Humane is an organization dedicated to protecting the welfare of animals. Their focus is on the care of captive exotics more than on the debate over whether or not they should be kept in captivity. I am not okay with people who take on private exotics that haven't give a lot of thought to what it's going to entail long term. Because eventually they're gonna run into a problem with resources, with care, with land, with security. And unless you have given a lot of thought to that, you're just not in a position to own an exotic like a tiger. The problem is, with a lot of people here in the U.S., you have some money, you have some means, you have some curiosity, and you think, ah, I'll take on a tiger and see what happens. But it's, it's not a good deal for the tiger, and, and sometimes it's not a good deal for the person. Even those highly experienced with keeping dangerous exotic animals agree that it is not for everybody. The thing is, can you get a tiger? Yes. Uh, can you get a Ferrari? Yes. Is it for everybody? No. A Ferrari is not a good family car. I don't think a tiger is necessarily a good family pet. Never. No. Nope. And, you know, this is someone who loves the animal, loves the species. In fact, my favorite animal, and I get asked this a lot, it's not a dog, it's a cheetah. So if I could own a big cat, it'd be great. But like for most who own tigers in the US, it's a novelty. They should own them. You know, they don't deserve that privilege of ownership with these animals. I don't think it's thought through in a lot of cases. No, no, even with my experience, my expertise, 20 years as a vet, I would not own a tiger. There are an estimated 10,000 big cats living in captivity in the United States. The majority are privately owned. And in many jurisdictions, people can keep a big cat on the property without reporting it to local officials or even to their neighbors. People think, hey, you have a tiger, what if it gets out? Well, the fact is, especially with tigers or any big cat, if they've gotten out, nothing's happened. There's no record of any big cat attacking, much less killing, anybody off the property. It's always on the property, on their territory. More of a case of you, as a person not used to being around tigers, would not know how to react properly if a tiger charged at you. Versus me, as I know what to do, you know, I can break it off in two seconds. You will turn and run, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a tiger crawling up your back. Animal attacks often occur when people react in a way that the animal doesn't understand or simply hasn't seen before. Like with the wolves, part of their greeting is mouthing. And they'll just come up, you know, put their mouth on your arm. They're not biting down or anything, but if it was anybody else that doesn't know that, they'll yank their arm away, and all of a sudden, they got mauled by a wolf, and when the the wolf had no intention of doing that. Animals put in unfamiliar situations are often more afraid of humans than we are of them. And that's when an encounter can become deadly. In other cases, owners are teaching their pets bad habits. And a lot of it comes from not knowing what they're doing. And some people just do the wrong things uh, in raising them. I remember seeing one video of a, one guy that used to play tug of war with his tiger at feeding time, you know, play tug of war. Well, his daughter ended up putting her arm in the enclosure and the tiger did what it was trained to do, played tug of war. And it's instances like that where, you know, the injuries and deaths come along. And the people being injured are the handlers, owners, or people in and around the big cats. And it's very simple. It's sort of like, if you don't want to die by skydiving, don't go skydiving. 
If you don't want to be injured by a big cat, don't go where the big cats are. So just why are Scott and Susanna willing to go where the big cats are? For the love of the animal. There's nothing like it when they come up and seek a reassurance from you. Something makes it nervous. It's like, is it OK? Yeah, yes, it's OK. Yeah, you can go do it. About 95% of what I do it for is for the animal, whichever animal may be. Some animals are more affectionate than others. You build a strong relationship with certain ones. The ones you raise from three weeks old or the one that you get four months old, it's just how the relationship develops. Australia is made up of two-thirds of desert. It's a harsh place for any animal to survive. This one has adapted perfectly to its environment. The dingo is a carnivore that was introduced from Asia around 5,000 years ago. And it has thrived in Australia ever since. A subspecies of the wolf, they can be seen as a pest by farmers and are known to kill livestock. But can they be a good pet? Dave Graham recognizes the dangers, but has chosen one as his companion. While it's rare to see a pure white dingo, what makes this one even more unusual is that the owner has fallen in love with her. Do I consider Alice uh, a pet or a best mate? I think, I think she's like my girlfriend. I can't be without her, and I don't think she can be without me. She owes me, she controls me, she's, oh my God. We have some arguments, but she always wins and she runs the household. She runs everything that we do. Dave is a farmer and a qualified animal behaviorist from Queensland. And from his experience working with dogs, he totally understands the genetic makeup of the dingo. The dingo is quite literally a dog that has gone back into a wolf-like state. When they first came to Australia, they went straight back into the bush and have become that wolf-like creature with the five elements that all the dogs that we now have have been bred out from. Dingoes have everything. They track, that's sniffing out their prey. They stalk their prey, which is where we've now got all of our herding breeds come from. They chase down their prey, which of course is our hunting dogs that we now have. Uh, they consume, rip apart their prey. And then of course, they also have that social aspect. They do work together. They really do work in packs. Using their paws, uh, using their teeth, really rip anything apart and they can get right inside, get the exact part of the, the animal that they want to eat with the amazing dexterity that these guys have. Farmers have blamed dingoes for causing large amounts of damage to livestock. As a farmer, Dave has witnessed some of the damage done to his sheep by wild dogs. When you grow up in the outback on uh, the inside of the, the dingo fence, uh, you have a difficult relationship with wild dogs. So my entire life, I've always seen uh, wild dogs as an enemy because I've seen the damage that they've done on our livestock, on my sheep. There were some nights that, um, that they would come in and, and take out 90 odd sheep, but not kill them, just, just rip them apart. And my job, of course, was to come through and, and uh, and put them down in a humane way. And uh, that was always difficult for me to um, appreciate the beauty of the dingo in the bush, but also the, the damage that they can um, bring to our farms. The dingo fence, the world's longest fence, originally built in the 1880s as a rabbit-proof fence, was converted in the 1940s into a dog barrier to protect sheep and cattle from dingoes. Over 5,000 kilometers long, and spread across three states, it has been partly successful in stopping dingoes from crossing the border and killing livestock. The dingoes that managed to get through were often shot by farmers as they were considered pests. So how does anyone consider this a safe pet? It's been a long journey for me to appreciate how beautiful and how valuable dingoes are to our bush, but I 
I'm under absolutely no delusion whatsoever that uh, that wild dogs and vulnerable animals um, mean lots of blood. There is a contradiction. In his farming life, Dave had to destroy wild dogs that were killing his livestock. Alice was the one dingo that stole his heart. Alice was found uh, about three and a half years ago. I was on the inside of the dingo fence in the outback of New South Wales, where wild dogs um, are exterminated. A farmer came across a litter of pups in a den, and uh, as he was uh, putting them all down, after he'd already put the mother down, of course, one of these offsiders, who was a contractor from the city, said, no, I really want to keep the white one. So he did, and took it back to the city and learned very, very quickly that dingoes are not dogs. You have to be extraordinarily skilled and you have to have extreme management plans and also very, very, very good fences to be able to keep a dingo in because they are wanderers and they don't require human interaction. And that's what uh, allows these relationships to flourish. In a well-managed situation, it is possible to have an incredible relationship with a dingo, as Dave has with Alice, together with an appreciation of the role of the dingo in the ecology of Australia. Look, she has 100% trust with me. Yeah, our whole relationship is built on a mutual trust. She knows I won't drop her or hurt her, but it's her favourite thing. Hold her upside down and she's happy. She'll be there for hours. It just loves it. But all dingoes love it. Anyone that has a dingo, that's what you do. You hold them upside down and then they're, they're happy. Mark from the Armadale Reptile Center looks after two dingoes, Kai and Jay, who were both previously kept as pets. When the owners discovered how much maintenance was required to keep them, Mark agreed to take the dingoes into his care. This is the great problem with a lot of people with pets. They don't think about it first. They go by feelings, not by their head. You can't just buy them on a whim. They're not like pups. Pups will fit in. They're very, very forgiving. Dingoes aren't really forgiving. Mark has had to work with the dingoes to gain acceptance from them. In particular, the older dingo, Kai, who is the alpha male, took longer to accept him. I've had Kai growl at me to start off with. Eventually he accepted me, but I couldn't go near Kai. Jay was fine. He was younger though, he was a little pup. That's the way he acted, but the other one backed off and he growled a little. And when they growl, you stand back. Unless they're humanised, they'll keep away from people. But in areas like Fraser Island where people feed them, they get used to it, and uh, if you don't feed them, they'll attack you. Fraser Island is a heritage area situated off the coast of Queensland, which has a population of protected dingoes. The public are giving guidelines to be dingo safe while on the island, for very good reason. There have been many cases of people being bitten by dingoes on Fraser Island, including a nine-year-old boy who was fatally attacked in 2001. Look, what I try and do with Alice is educate people that you need to be respectful of any wild animal in its environment. It's king, and you have to respect it. Don't go near them. Don't feed them, don't do anything except for appreciate that they are doing their job by existing in the bush as Australia's apex predator. When you start to feed a wild animal, it's gonna to start to lose the fear, and then as soon as it loses fear, well then it's gonna look for food uh, when you're not supplying it, and you may come into conflict. Alice is an albino dingo, and it must be remembered that at her core, she is a pure blood and there is always a risk that the wolf within could come to the fore, something that Dave never forgets when he takes her into the public domain. They are predators. There's no two ways about it. They develop their wild instincts as well. One of the ways they show their being alpha 
is height. They like to get up above you, looking down on you. You notice that our fences are six foot high and they angle back into the enclosure. That's so they can't climb out because they can climb a six foot fence. They're a wolf. Anything that gets in their enclosure is food. Doesn't matter what it is. A rat runs through or something like that, they'll eat it. A bird flies low, they'll catch it. A young child could upset one and it could snap and they do have very powerful jaws. They'll kill very quickly and you can't stop that. While attacks on humans are relatively uncommon, one of the most well-known dingo attacks occurred in 1980 near Uluru, Central Australia. Lindy Chamberlain, mother of nine-week-old baby girl Azaria, was convicted of her murder. The Chamberlains maintained their baby was taken from their tent by a dingo. And in 1986, following the discovery of Azaria's jacket near a dingo lair, Lindy Chamberlain was immediately released from prison. In 2012, following years of speculation and inquiries, the coroner concluded that the cause of Azaria's death was as a result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. When you ask people instantly, they think of Lindy Chamberlain, the terrible death of her daughter by the jaws of a dingo. So that's prevalent in people's minds. But I think we do have a love affair with dingoes because they're just so strange, so distant and so rare. I mean, you would be hard pressed to find too many Australians that have seen a real dingo in the wild because they naturally just blend in to the environment. That's the job and that's why for hundreds of years of white settlement and of course the thousands of years that they've been here during Aboriginal settlement, they have just inserted themselves into the ecology. But at the same time, these guys are using those jaws every single day to um, get through life. And uh, when you need to eat to survive, it brings you up against humans because we're growing animals out there, sheep, cattle, goats, pigs, and of course these guys are hunting in that same territory. So we do really have a love-hate relationship in Australia. Alice has a natural tendency to investigate her surroundings, a trait that's typical of a dingo. She uses her highly tuned senses to great effect around the house. One of the things that makes dingoes different from dogs is that dingoes love to climb. They're up on top of everything, into everything. It doesn't matter how small the surface is. They need to check it out thoroughly and know what's going on in their environment. Yeah, she loves getting up on top of things, but it's really this super investigation and this crazy brain that just needs to know exactly what's going on. They always look like they're chilled, but I think it's because, well, they've got a lot to think about that they've just investigated and they're just going through all their different TV shows that they've got inside their head of all the different adventures they've been on. One could be easily mistaken after seeing Alice's relationship with Dave, that dingoes make an ideal pet. The reality is that Alice is a wild animal and by her very nature is a predator. Are we ready? You're being very good too. I love my dingo, but uh, they do not make good pets. They are a wild animal that belongs in the wild. It's just that at the moment I belong to Alice. They don't bark, which seems great, but they do everything else that could possibly drive you crazy. They shed continuously. Everything gets covered in dingo hair. They get into everything and of course trying to contain them is almost impossible but at the end of the day they don't need us. They don't need to be looked after us and when you've got several hundred breeds of dog to choose from, I'd stick with dogs. It's clear that dingoes are a high maintenance animal and anyone who tries to domesticate one will have limited success. Dave, who has a license to keep Alice, has worked with dingoes for many years and knows what's involved to keep Alice under control for her own safety and the safety of others. It doesn't matter where I am, Alice will always be tethered to me or tethered to one of my domestic dogs. It's just a case of if she feels that she needs to run off on a trail, she will run off on a trail after a rabbit or after a rat and she's gone. So I've got to make sure that she is absolutely safe at all times. 
At the end of the day, she is magnificent. She is an incredible, loving, adorable friend who, um, she's just so sweet, but you've got to always remember, she's a wild animal. And not that she could turn in any second, not that she's unpredictable, but she is predictable. She will fight to survive. And uh, that's what they've been doing in this country for five to 8,000 years. So it's not that I don't trust her, it's that I do trust her that one day she could bite and could really do some serious damage. 68% of American households own at least one pet and many are choosing to own animals that could be considered exotic. The legal definition is subject to local jurisdiction, but generally an exotic pet is one that is rare, unusual, or a wild animal, not typically kept by humans. Often, that's because those animals can be deadly. It's better to be bitten by an angry snake than a hungry snake, because a hungry snake won't let go for a while. But. Uh, but they're, they're very popular and should not be kept around small children uh, because the small children are edible. More than 20 years ago, Ken Foos opened a reptile and exotic specialty store. And it's the type of store that is getting harder to find in the US. The animals he sells range from those that can just give you a nasty bite to those that can kill in a matter of minutes. This is our second largest selling animal. You would think us being a reptile store, it would be all reptiles, but this, this is a, a, a pygmy hedgehog. They're very popular. We sell hundreds of these, and I wouldn't own one if you gave it to me. But, um, but we sell a lot of them. It's basically an animated rock. Regulations around owning exotic pets are different in every state of the U.S. In Nevada, pretty much anything goes. There's not a lot that we can't have. Uh, I mean, I can have a tiger in here for sale. Why would I? Uh, I'm not qualified to own a tiger. Most of the people I know are not qualified to own a tiger. It's the same thing with primates. We used to sell, we can sell monkeys here. We can sell chimpanzees. We can sell anything we want. But 99% of the people on this planet are not qualified to own a monkey, period. And. I'm, I, I sold monkeys for five years, and I just got tired of looking for that 1%. Foose's biggest selling pet may not look frightening, but as a carnivore, it certainly can bite. It can also be dangerous to the environment, and that's why it's illegal to own one across the border in California. You can own a snake, a tiger, or even a bear, but you can't own a ferret. Many of Ken's customers are committing an offense when taking their new furry pets across the state line from Nevada. But Ken is very careful that he doesn't break the law when selling animals, including ferrets. He even plays a role in lobbying government to ensure that regulations surrounding the keeping of exotic and dangerous pets are relevant for both animals and owners. My, my biggest concern with keeping dangerous reptiles and amphibians. I'm talking about rattlesnakes, uh, large constrictors like, like a chem or, or something that is potentially life-threatening. If someone comes in here and buys a rattlesnake from me, I of course quiz them, how are you doing this? Where do you live? I ask them where you live because in the county, they're not gonna let you have one. In the city of Las Vegas, you're required to have a permit. And I wrote the regulations for the permit. If you live down the street and you said you were qualified to keep a rattlesnake, I'll sell it to you. And if you die, or your wife dies, or your kids die, or your dog dies because of the snake, I don't care. I mean, you know, your choice, I don't care. If the three-year-old girl living three doors down in her backyard gets bit by the snake because it escaped from your house, that I care about. And the reason is, people die from hamster bites. People die from all kinds of animals. And when you accept the risk that comes with owning an exotic animal, you've accepted the risk. Animal ownership laws and regulations are constantly changing, and Ken's whole team are passionate about supporting animal owners' rights. They went from, we were able to keep any size snake, really, to, okay, well, now you can keep a snake that's typically under 12 feet. 
but you need to have this permit and this, and the permit's the same as where you would own a sloth or um, a hide buddy or anything bigger that requires bigger space. I have to sit there and notify every one of my neighbors. I have to measure from my front door to the edge of my street, from the back door to the edge of the street, the back door to my fence line. It's just government overreach, wanting to know everything that you keep in your house and why you're keeping it. But it's something that we fight for. I mean, all of us that are passionate fight for and come together and try to make sure that those laws don't pass. Staff member Georgia has 48 reptiles, including several ball pythons, a reticulated python, a couple of boas, some iguanas, some red-footed tortoises, a water monitor, and that's not all. Um, nine ferrets, the genet, five dogs, three cats, and a bunch of rats. <laughs> like many exotic pet owners, Georgia's life would be turned upside down by more restrictive animal laws. I think I would do my best to move because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give up that's like my thing, that's, you know, I love them all, so I wouldn't, I would leave. <laughs> as fun as ferrets may be, they'd be easy prey for many of the other animals in Ken Fusa's store. Though Nevada has strict ideas about which snakes locals are allowed to keep as pets. Only venomous snakes native to Nevada and rear fanged snakes are allowed to be kept in the state. There are two types of venomous snake those that inject venom through fangs in the front of their mouths, like rattlesnakes or cobras, and those with fangs at the back of their mouths. They chew the venom into their prey. And then there are the snakes that can literally squeeze the life out of you. All right. Hey, Kim, what are you, what are you pulling out here? This is a uh, tiger reticulated python. Uh, it's about 15 feet long. Air gas grabbed the other end of this one. My back wall cannabis. Uh, they do very well in captivity. Like I said, the only real downside to them is they get too big. Um, if a snake like this bites you, you're going to know it. And you'll bleed. They're not deadly. They won't kill you. But they'll, they'll, they'll hurt you a little bit. And snakes aren't the only creatures in store with a venomous bite. Uh, this is a beaded lizard. They come from uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, they are they are venomous. Uh, they've got these um, venom glands in their lower jaw, and they don't have fangs, but they have very very sharp jagged teeth. They're actually really easy to keep, and they're generally pretty mellow. But it's also the excitement you've got a beaded lizard. They, um, you know, there's something romantic about having one. Beaded lizards can grow to three and a half feet long and are related to the Gila monster. They're the only two venomous lizards in the world and can deliver an extremely painful bite. And they just tend not to let go. Uh, they will hang on to you uh, forever. There is no anti-venom for this. They, they won't kill you. Years ago, we had um, someone break into one of the cages and stole one of our beaded lizards. Uh, and it was a baby, it was about four inches long. And he put it in his pocket. As he reached into the cage to grab it, he got bit. And then when he put it in his pocket, he got bit again. And ended up uh, going to the hospital. So he recovered, he made a full recovery, and in fact came into the store about a year later and stole something else from us. But we caught him that time. Yeah, but they're very, very cool, and, and people like them because they're a novelty. They're different, they're not lethal. Uh, it's not an animal that can kill you. It's almost like the throat, same thing, there's a lot of people that keep rattlesnakes and cobras and, and things like that. And I think it's just the novelty of it. People that just really like venomous reptiles. Uh, I can understand it, I don't own any myself, uh, but I used to. And there's kind of a thrill there and they're very, very neat. And it's not just venomous reptiles that people consider exciting pets. Arachnids, better known as scorpions and spiders, are also a popular, if not unusual, companion. Nothing elicits as much fear in so many as the spider. Yet, Exotic Pets staff member Gaz has been fascinated with them from a young age. I was about eight years old and my, my first 
pet was uh, two leopard gecko lizards. And then after that, it was a tarantula, a rose hare. Yeah, so they, they were my first kind of pets. And then like, my mum didn't like snakes. So I got a corn snake from a friend of mine and I had to keep it hidden. I had it hidden for a year before my mum found out. The largest of the spiders, tarantulas, may appear deadly, but their venom won't kill you. That's not to say that their large fangs won't cause some damage or that their venom is completely harmless. You know, there's certain species of tarantulas that it's not recommended to handle. Um, like some of the old world species, like the Poclotheria, you know, they're, um, you know, from like India, Sri Lanka, those areas. Um, they, they, they've got a pretty potent venom. It's gonna make you feel pretty rough for a few days if you get bitten by one of those. That's a Goliath 30, and now they are very big, very big fangs and very aggressive. So it's really not recommended to hold those guys. Large fangs and potent venom aren't a tarantula's only means of inflicting pain on their human owners. As a defense mechanism against larger predators, many species of tarantulas flick tiny hairs off their abdomen. These hairs can irritate the eyes, nose, and even the lungs. So this is a new world species, so they've got these urticating hairs, which is their first line of defense is to flick these hairs. So they're, they're a little bit docile, you know, so they're not prone to bite. Their first line of defense is to flick hairs. So I wonder if it'll do it. See how he's, he's rubbing his back legs now, in his abdomen? That flicks up these hairs. So he's a bit of a hair flicker, but usually his species is not too bad. Oh yeah, they've got fangs and, uh, you know, they've got venom, just like all spiders. There are more than 1,700 different types of scorpion, though only about 20 of them have venom powerful enough to kill a person. The most dangerous scorpion, the Indian red, could kill you within 24 hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was stung by an emperor and a nation. I was, you know, I was just being foolish, you know. But yeah, they're actually a really easy going. Yeah. Don't threaten them, and they do pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the things with these, you want to be more worried about their pinch than the sting. Mm. Their pinch is really hard, and they don't let go. They'll, they'll make you bleed. Yeah, they'll make you bleed, man. It's real hard. But their sting, like I said, I got stung by them. Once again, it was like a wasp sting, you know, a little bit of irritation for about 30 minutes, and that's it. As long as you don't, because uh, that's a big stinger. See yeah. the stinger in there? It's like a nail going into your hand. And it's not just teeth and fangs you have to watch out for. Many of the animals, Ken sells, can hurt you in more than one way. There's a risk to anything. I mean, it's like I said before, it doesn't matter whether it's a hamster. There's always an inherent risk. Uh, of course, we would tell people this is a rear fang stay, be careful. But, uh, but beyond that, this is not another animal that could never hurt you. The, the venom is, uh, is, is not strong enough to do more than like a localized swelling. Um, the snakes, the, the, the animals that I have in here, quite frankly, that, that hurt you the most are things like these. Claws. It's, it's, the, the, it's the teeth and the jaws and, and the claws. These, these are not from snake bites. These are from these people's, these animals' toenails. Now these, the key thing here, there we go. The key thing with these things is you control the legs. And that way you don't bleed. This is what I call tame. Um, uh, when they first came in, there's no way I could hold them like that. So I would be bleeding all over the place. Uh, I've never seen one try to bite, but they rip you to pieces with these very sharp claws. So many of the animals in Ken's store have bites that can rip skin or inject venom or claws that can draw blood. Why would anyone want to own them? They're just such cool animals, you know? It's just, they're, you know, they're, I've always found them fascinating. Um, from from the, the tiniest of little, like, common house spiders, you know? It's just beautiful. They're just fascinating animals, man. I've always been fascinated by them. It's the thrill. It's it's why do people race cars or or hang glide? It's everybody has their own adrenaline fix and that they've chosen. And this is a lot of people. This is it. And for as long as there is a demand for exotic pets, Ken Fus and his team will continue to fight for the rights of animal owners to keep them. Not everyone should keep a lizard. Not everyone should keep a dog or a cat or even a mouse. Uh, why would anyone have the big python or have, have this or have that? And I'm like, P 
people jump out of perfectly good airplanes every day. Why are you going to ban skydiving? And there, there, a lot of these legislators say they're trying to protect us from ourselves. Well, if you're going to protect us from ourselves, uh, ban smoking or ban drinking or ban skydiving or car racing or football. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we do to hurt ourselves and we do it on purpose. So it's, it, it makes absolutely no sense to uh, ban something that actually as benign as this.